Tuesday, September 22nd to order. And the first item is approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Are there any requested changes or additions? We do have uh, remove uh, item eight on the agenda, which was uh, to um, address fence viewers and a Memorial Sports Commission member. And we didn't uh, receive any applicants for either position and we'll have to relist that. Are there any other changes? Okay, I guess hearing none, uh, all in favor of approving the revised agenda, signal with a thumbs up. Okay. And uh, Nick is uh, out on a job site, so not joining us. So we have six and then one, one absent. Uh, next is approval of the minutes of our September 8th regular select board meeting. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Are there any requested amendments to those draft minutes? Okay, hearing none, all in favor of approving the September 8th minutes as drafted, signify with a thumbs up. One abstention for me, Brian. Yep, and Heather's abstaining because she was uh, doing payroll. So next is citizen comments. And Chris, maybe you could tell us if there's someone who's on uh, <clears throat> for something that's not on the agenda. If you are on for something that's not on the agenda, if you could raise your hand in the uh, in the screen uh, through the is that the chat function or how is it that they do that? Uh, at the bottom of the screen, there are is a button for raise hand. Okay. So if you're in for something that's not on the agenda, if you could raise your hand, I'll give you just a few seconds to find that button. Are you? Okay. Uh, we have one raised hand from Judy Weiger Gross. Okay. If you could, uh, let her in here. Okay. Go ahead, Judy. Good evening, Judy. Hi. Um, I just wanted to make sure I was connected. But I'm also uh, curious about the clear cutting at the airport and I, uh, north of the airport. And I, yeah. Um, at what point are you guys going to weigh it? Uh, Brian? Kathleen? It's Kathleen. Um, uh, Lindsay reached out to me about this this afternoon and asked that the board put this on their agenda for the October 13th meeting to discuss uh, what the process is going forward and how the town might be involved. Okay. Have they dropped the Act 250 permit in yet? The Act 250 permit is up for a public hearing on October 22nd. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll have a, that on the agenda for the, for the next uh, board meeting. And uh, it looks like uh, we have to have some, if we're going to take a position, we need to do it fairly quickly. So may I ask one clarifying question? Absolutely. Was there a pre-hearing scheduled also? I thought I saw something in the correspondence about a pre-hearing. There is a pre-hearing schedule for October 8th. And where will that be? I do not know the, where it's going to be held, Judy. And how do I find that out? Why don't I, when I find out where it is, I'll certainly let you know, Judy, and we could include that in our meetings and events as well. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much. We, we should get a notification on that, shouldn't we, Kathleen? Uh, yes, we will. We've asked for a notification on that. Okay. Okay, good. All right, next, uh, Chris, any other hands raised? Uh, no other hands raised at this time. Okay. So then we'll move on to an update from Chief Hanley on uh, local, local emergency management. <clears throat> 
Hi, am I on? You are, Chief. I'm Maybe. not getting any indication of where I am. I'm in the space someplace. <laughs> so, um, we're getting some mask pushback and some uh, governor's orders pushback from some folks out there. I had an attorney call me who represented some local businesses and asked for some help with getting them some proper procedures on how to deal with this. I provided them some advice on what to do. And uh, I ran that by the attorney general at our weekly conference last week, and it's all okay with that. So essentially I've told them if they're coming in there and they're absolutely refusing to wear a mask, don't get into a conflict. There's no need to be fighting with them. If you know who they are, just you can send them a trespass order. And then if they show up again, um, and then it's trespassing. Again, they don't have a constitutional right as they claim to go into somebody else's property and assert their uh, right, so-called right. There is none. It's private property. You enter conditionally on the wishes of the owner. And so that's been a little bit of a problem. Um, we've not had to respond to anything. And I think they're just going to handle it within the businesses and get us involved if it uh, becomes a further problem. We've had no complaints or reports about student activity at all. Uh, they've been out and around, but we see them about um, engaged a few of them the other night for drinking in a public area, but uh, minor stuff, the routine student stuff, but nothing violating any of the rules. Um, our local schools, as you probably heard from the governor, are now going to phase three, but just understand phase three is permissive. It's not an, or it's not a mandate. So schools can decide how much and how far they want to go in that phase three as far as opening some sports, uh, mixing up student groups, uh, using their cafeteria and gymnasium. That'll be up to the school district to decide that. So they're allowed to do that if they want, but it's not a mandate that they do that at this point. Uh, some of the other stuff, uh, you know, bars can be open now. People can be seated at the bar as long as they're at least six feet apart and that they've got the uh, Lexan or acrylic kind of uh, barrier there for the bartender. So they need to put that up. And also this does not uh, increase the capacity. Capacity is still limited to 50% of the uh, fire marshal's capacity for the building. They can just move around a little more, sit at the bar, or sit at a table. That's that's good, but just understand this was does not increase capacity. And finally, just here locally, uh, we're showing that there are a total of eight Middlebury cases since March. That's gone up a little bit. And I don't know if that included the false positive, if that was ever taken down off of that, that total. Anyway, it's a pretty small number for six months of COVID. Uh, and case growth around the state remains very low, only two cases overnight. So we're still in pretty good shape, but that's no reason to be lackadaisical because elsewhere in this country and over in Europe, uh, things are not good. Uh, they're seeing uh, very, very big case growth, especially in uh, college cities. Uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland is one. They want to actually shut down part of that city, if not all that city, and go back to lockdown because of the case growth and hundreds and hundreds of students not following any kind of orders. They've actually turned the police on them. Now the police over there have their version of a citation, several dozen students. So we're seeing that kind of lapses going on and we just, we don't want to see that here. We're in good shape. The students are, are in good shape here. We want to set an example and not fall into that as we're seeing in other areas. And that's about it. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions for Chief? Uh, a quick question, Chief. Um, the restaurants are still 50%, but are the motels 100% now? Yeah, motels can go to 100%. Mot Logic can go to 100%. Okay, it's just the restaurants are still 50%, right? Yeah, restaurants are 50% of capacity. Bars can put them at the bar or the counter, like at Rosie's, but they've got to be six feet apart. Okay, all right, thanks. Any other questions for Chief? Chief, we didn't see you on video tonight. <laughs> I don't know where I am, frankly. <laughs> um, it could be on Mars for all I know. Yeah, it looks it. I'm not getting any indication whether I've got a mic on or off or if I'm where I am. But <laughs> I think we missed seeing you on Friday also. Or did we? Did I miss you? Uh, I was not there on Friday. I was at the governor's press conference on Friday trying to extract more information from him. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I was not able to go. There's unfortunately too much going on that I needed to be uh, tuned to. Well, we appreciate your dedication to this side of the business. And uh, thanks for keeping us informed. You're welcome.
Okay, thanks, Chief. Uh, next, then, we're going to move to an appointment of uh, alternate representatives to the Addison County Communications Union District and the representative and alternate representatives to the Addison County Regional Planning Commission's Transportation Advisory Committee. At its August 11th meeting, the board appointed Ross Conrad as Middlebury's representative to the governing board of the Addison County Communications Union District. At it's August 11th meeting. Two openings remain for the first and second alternate to the governing board and residents Andy Hooper and Hugh McLaughlin have expressed interest in being appointed as alternates. Julie Dos, Dos, Dos Santos, currently Middlebury's alternate on the Regional Planning Commission has expressed an interest in being appointed as the town's delegate to the Transportation Advisory Committee. If the board is amenable to this, Kathleen Ramsey, the current delegate, would move to alternate. Come questions, comments from the board. I'll make a motion. Um, I move to appoint um, Andy Hooper as first alternative to the governing board of the Addison County Communications Union District and Hugh McLaughlin as the second alternate. Second. Okay, any comments on that? Are, are they in the meeting and want to speak at all, Chris? Uh, I don't see any of them here at this point. Okay. They were two of the most enthusiastic applicants I've ever had. I like it. Maybe community service is making a rebound here. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm not seeing any hands up to speak. So we'll go ahead and vote. And um, all in favor of the motion as Heather uh, put it up for Andy as first and Hugh as second alternate signify with a thumbs up. All right. And the next it would be a delegate to the Addison County Regional Planning Commission's TAC. I move to appoint uh, Jilly, Dos, Jilly Dos Santos, I'm saying Jill Dos Santos um, as Middlebury's delegate to the Addison County Regional Planning Commission's Transportation Advisory Committee and Kathleen Ramsey as alternate. Second. Any comments on that? Other than Jill, if you heard my comments and I called you Jilly, it's because of a little bit of a typo and I apologize. Actually, Brian, the typo was mine. It should be Jilly. <laughs> it should be Jilly? Okay. Yes. So, all in uh, favor of uh, the motion to appoint Julie Dos Santos, uh, signify with thumbs up. Okay. So, we have uh, three uh, positions filled, um, and we'll be looking for people to, to volunteer to be fence viewers and Memorial Sports Commission member coming up. Uh, recommendation of the local health officers to Vermont Department of Health and uh, the town has received notification, notification from the Vermont Department of Health that Tom Scanlon's three-year term of office as town health officer will expire on October 31st. The board is now called upon either to recommend Tom's reappointment or replacement to the Department of Health. Tom has indicated that he is interested in serving another three-year term if the board is agreeable. This is also an opportunity for the board to take similar action in regard to the position of deputy health officer. Parks and Recreation Superintendent Dustin Hunt currently serves in that role. and He also has indicated his willingness to be considered for reappointment. Comments? Pleasure of the board. Uh, I move to recommend to the Vermont Department of Health the reappointment of Tom Scanlon as town health officer and the reappointment of Dustin Hunt as deputy town health officer. 
Second. Move in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion signify with thumbs up. And I want to thank uh, both Tom and Dustin for serving in that. Uh, certainly, I know I've seen Tom uh, pretty active on, on that. And uh, Dustin is uh, a grooming a fine young man here. So love it. Uh, next, then, we're going to get Howard and Richard in to give us a presentation on uh, carbon emission reduction goals. So, uh, Chris, if you could invite them in. They okay, should Richard. be here. Uh, good evening, Howard. Hi, how are you? Good. Well, thanks for having us back here. Um, so let me introduce this and then I'm gonna have Richard will give the presentation. Um, so just a summary. So we were here, I guess it was back in February. This was before Zoom. And uh, we had presented uh, Richard, um, uh, some of his work on the energy committee's strategy for reducing greenhouse gas for the municipal um, greenhouse gas consumption. And uh, we the takeaway from that meeting was for us to get a little bit more feedback from the department heads. And the question is, was this a feasible goal that we had put forth? And we received some good feedback from the department heads. And uh, Bill Kernan uh, had some very good comments. And a lot of it was tied to uh, finances. You know, we have to be realistic with what we can put it, put towards this to actually get to our goals. And as a result, uh, Richard, who's done a great job with all of this, a phenomenal job, went off and processed the data, redid some of the numbers. And within that, we've made some adjustments to the goals to the point where we think it's definitely, it's a much more feasible goal, something that we think is achievable. Uh, you know, the last time we came, it was you know, questionable, there wasn't enough data to really to, to support that. Now, I think with Richard's work, we can show you that this is achievable and you should see that in what he's about to present. So we're hoping that you will um, buy into this strategy and if nothing else, it's a goal. And I think Heather, you mentioned last time, it's good to have a goal. So even if we fall short, we're still, we, we're still striving towards something. So I think, in this case, it is achievable, and I think it will benefit everyone for us to try to get as close to this goal as possible. So with that, let me uh, let Richard take over. You're muted. Yeah, Richard, you're on mute. Let's try this again. Okay. Okay, I can hear you. Okay. Um, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the select board. I'm glad to be here. Um, are you gonna show the slides that I sent around or would you like me to show them? Good, okay, thank you. So, um, you know, I'll just introduce this. You know, I, I'm, an, I'm an epidemiologist. I'm a physician and I'm an epidemiologist. I retired from the Florida Department of Health seven years ago. Um, I'm a pretty good data analyst and um, I've wanted to put my analytic skills to work on addressing what I think is the, the biggest single issue of our time, which is runaway uh, greenhouse gases and climate change. Um, you know, you, you've all, I'm sure, heard the phrase that we should uh, think globally and act locally. Well, this is the act locally part of, uh, of that syllogism. Um, in, in my own house, um, we, uh, we replaced natural gas with electricity. We, inst we uh, insulated our house. We, we installed uh, solar panels. 
all in an effort to reduce our carbon footprint. We still have a gasoline powered car, but our strategy is that next time we need to replace the car, it'll be an electric car, not a gasoline car. And I'm proposing something a little similar to this for, for, for the town of Middlebury and its own operations. So if you could advance the slide. So what we're asking, what the, what, the, what the energy committee is asking of the select board, we would like to see the town adopt a goal for a specific reduction in carbon dioxide emissions by a specific date. This would be an actionable goal that would set a, a numeric target and a, a date. Our original proposal in February was for an 80% reduction in eight years. Uh, we're now proposing an 80% reduction in 10 years. You know, when we, we proposed this originally, I said that in, in eight years, I would be 80 years old uh, if I lived that long. And I was hoping to live to see the town meet this goal. I'm now 73, so 10 more years, I'll be 83. And again, I'm still hoping to be around to see us achieve this goal, although it's a little less likely. Can I have the next slide, please? You're still a young man. Uh, of course, of course. <laughs> so you know, we've learned a lot from the town department heads and from others we've been talking to. We've done some additional analysis. The committee envisions that if you all adopt a goal with a specific numeric target and a date, that the energy committee would be charged with the responsibility of measuring our CO2 emissions each year to assess progress towards the goal. We're not experts on vehicles or on buildings. Uh, we're just motivated citizens who are trying to be informed and want to try to contribute to the process in a constructive way. The next slide, please. So our original approach that we presented to you in February was electrify everything, leave diesel, vehicles, leave diesel vehicles alone for now and make no new investments in fossil fuel burning equipment or vehicles. The electrify everything meant converting all building heat to coal climate electric heat pumps and converting all cars, pickups and SUVs, gasoline powered vehicles to electric vehicles. So that was our original proposal and we thought it was feasible, but there were, there were some places where it was a little unrealistic. We did assume that Green Mountain Power will succeed in making its delivered electricity carbon free within the eight year time frame. They're really, they're already close to doing that. The next slide, please. So the big picture of where our CO2 comes from now on an annual basis, we produce 920 tons of carbon dioxide from our operations. Gasoline powered vehicles are 153 tons, diesel powered 146, they're about equal. Electricity is about 377 tons and building heat produces 244 tons. So each of those is a significant contributor to our carbon dioxide. And you, we probably can't uh, meet, reach an 80% goal without addressing each of these four, at least to some degree. The next slide. So we think that we can replace fossil fuels with electricity while reducing our CO2 production. Uh, we assume that the CO2 content of the Green Mountain Power's electricity goes to zero by 2030. That's what they say. The quote at the bottom is from GMP. GMP is committed to being 100% carbon free by 2025 and 100% renewable by 2030. They're already at 208 pounds of carbon dioxide per megawatt hour. Now that doesn't mean as a number it doesn't mean much, but the New England regional average is three to four times as high as Green Mountain Power's delivered, delivered power. It's so low because we, Green Mountain Power gets a great deal of its electricity from Quebec, from Quebec Hydro, that's hydropower. There are environmental problems with hydropower too, as there are with wind, as there are with solar, um, but greenhouse gases is not one of the environmental problems associated with, with hydro and CO2 is not one of them. So uh, we, we assume that by 10 years from now, that by 2030, that Green Mountain Power will in fact be 100% renewable. That is, they won't be burning any CO2 to produce their electricity. Next slide, please. So how do we get there? So this strategy is in four domains, gasoline powered vehicles, diesel powered vehicles and equipment, electricity and building heat. And I'll address each of those in turn. Next slide. 
So, you know, we think about how we might reduce carbon dioxide from gasoline. The, the basic strategy would be to say when vehicles need to be replaced by the available vehicles that meet the requirements with the least gasoline consumption. So compared to standard gas powered vehicles, um, you can buy more fuel, you can buy more fuel efficient vehicles right, and save maybe 10 to 20% of your CO2 production. You can buy hybrid gas electric vehicles and save maybe 40%. You can buy plug-in hybrid electric vehicles like a plug-in Prius for and save perhaps 70% of the CO2. Or you can buy electric vehicles and save 100% of it, assuming the, the, again that the electricity is carbon free. So that, um, there's a piece in, in today's New York Times that suggests that at least for cars and light trucks, that we're really more than, no more than three or four years away from the electric vehicles being the same price as the corresponding gas vehicles. And the federal subsidies won't be necessary anymore to get people to buy electric vehicles on price alone. So by, by 2025, and certainly well before 2030, electric vehicles will have smaller batteries, and more fuel, more energy dense batteries, and the price of the vehicles will have come down to where they are competitive with gasoline powered vehicles and are cheaper to operate. So it's not unrealistic to think that every time we need to replace the vehicle, we can move down this scale towards more and more fuel efficient, uh, more, and for, more and more carbon dioxide efficient vehicles. There's also a rapid start technology available in it for existing gas powered vehicles. And I, I, I mentioned this without really having any deep expertise in it. And we can reduce the miles driven as a way to reduce CO2 production. So those are, that's the gasoline piece. The next slide is about diesel. Ross Conrad, whose name was mentioned earlier in this, in this meeting, um, has been advocating very strongly that we can move ahead without really waiting by replacing fossil fuel-based diesel with biodiesel, diesel that has its origins in, uh, in commonly used uh, uh, domestic and commercial products. The, the biodiesel um, doesn't use any fossil fuel. It's based on um, oils and, and uh, um, other lipids that are that 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 are being recycled. Diesel diesel fuel, as as I'm sure many of you know, the price of diesel fuel is fairly volatile. The, the price of biodiesel uh, it tends to be very consistent. It's competitive with with uh, regular diesel fuel in price, uh, and mm -hmm. it is much less volatile in price. It has zero net CO two emissions, and in principle. Um, we could replace fossil fuel diesel with biodiesel right away. But we also need to be moving towards replacing diesel vehicles and diesel equipment with uh, vehicles that have the least fuel consumption possible, including perhaps some electric vehicles. Um, 10 years from now, we may be able to buy electric uh, dump trucks and electric fire engines and uh, other large uh, vehicles that, that we currently really are stuck with fossil fuel burning vehicles. The next slide. To reduce the carbon dioxide from electricity, we don't need to do anything because Green Mountain Power is doing it based on the mandates that they've received from the state of Vermont. Um, so um, although there are good reasons to be efficient with respect to our use of electricity, we don't actually need to economize on our electricity in order to reduce our CO2 production. Many times nothing is still nothing. Um, if the electricity doesn't produce any CO2, then purely from a CO2 point of view, economizing on it doesn't much matter. What does matter is the cost of the town of, the, of doing the tasks that we need to do that we use electricity for. So town, our view is that town investments and the efficiency of electric use should be evaluated mainly on their financial return. And many such investments, in fact, would have very good return on investment. 
The town can also generate some of its own electricity via solar farms or via, via an anaerobic digester at the wastewater treatment plant. And that can reduce the environmental costs of, of, of the electricity that comes from Green Mountain Power even further. And it can insulate us from rate instability. Uh, and and um, efficiency can do the same thing as generating our own electricity. On to the next, thank you. Next slide. Um, reducing carbon dioxide from building heat requires us to convert buildings that use fossil fuels for heat to uh, using cold climate heat pumps. We already know that the consultant who, to the town who reviewed the, the options for the Ellsley Library recommended cold climate heat pumps as the sole heat source for Ellsley Library. And if a drafty old building like Ellsley can be heated with, uh, with cold climate heat pumps, it's, it's certainly very encouraging that, that other buildings could be as well. We've been assuming that, that um, heating systems last 20 years and then they need to be replaced. And so we actually, uh, we were, the, the town staff helped us a lot in identifying what year the various heating systems were installed in the various buildings and therefore what year they might need to be replaced. Uh, if we just replace heating systems as they wear out on, on a 20 year basis, we can get to 80% in, in, uh, in 10 years. But if we convert some buildings sooner than, the, than absolutely necessary, we can bring the benefits forward uh, in time. In the meantime, we can invest in energy efficiency and conservation to, uh, to keep our buildings warm and comfortable. Next slide. Um, so there's a sequential approach. Um, the library, the police station, and the two buildings of the wastewater treatment plant that are occupied most of the time would be the two, that would be the three buildings that we would address first. And as soon as we can replace the heating systems in those buildings with non-fossil fuel systems, we can reduce our CO2 by 49%. We can get to almost half, uh, almost half reduction in our CO2 by replacing the heating systems in those three buildings with non-fossil fuel systems. We can get a little further uh, in a few years by converting the pool house and the teen center to cold climate electric heat pumps. Converting the fire stations wouldn't come due for a replacement until 2032, which is outside our time frame, And the recreation center wouldn't come due until 2036, which is way outside our time frame. And then the, the public works building itself uh, was last updated in 2018. And so it will be the last building, unless the public works building is in fact rebuilt or remodeled before then. Uh, as I've heard talk of, in which case uh, this, this might happen earlier. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so uh, this is some specifics about specific buildings. Ilsley, we I already mentioned, the police station heating system is in need of review and replacement. Chief Hanley is very, uh, very keen on, on updating his systems. The Energy Committee is planning to hire a consultant to make recommendations on how and roughly how much it would cost to heat the, the police department building with cold climate heat pumps uh, and how much more or less it might cost than the conventional approach. The wastewater treatment plant, the office building and the, and the shop building are heated now with, with uh, propane. If the town moves ahead with an anaerobic digestion system for the waste stream at the wastewater treatment plant, then there will be uh, methane produced uh, that can be used to run the heating systems for those two buildings. And so we will get off of fossil fuels. And then the teen house and the teen center and pool house are, are ripe for investments in efficiency and for replacement of their propane heating systems. The next slide. Um, so th these would be the actual amounts uh, in, in 22 or 2022 or 23. The library, we could save 31 tons. The police station, we could save 21 tons. The wastewater treatment plant, we could save 64 tons. You can see that the, the wastewater treatment plant uh, project would be uh, a really a, a very big uh, benefit. Um, next slide. 
the monthly bills would be about the same after you convert from a, from a fossil fuel to the heat pumps across all the buildings. The monthly cost will go down a little bit compared to fuel oil, they'd be unchanged from propane, they'd go up a little from natural gas. And we have some buildings heated with each of those sources and across the board where there would probably not be much change. But that assertion on my part is based on the present prices for fossil fuels and for electricity remaining uh, stable over time. And we have no idea what's going to happen to the prices of fossil fuels or electricity over the next 10 years. We, we, we have to assume they're going to be about the same, but we actually don't know. Um, we didn't factor maintenance costs into this assessment. Um, cold climate heat pumps are, are thought to be very low maintenance. Um, that's certainly what I've been assuming with the ones that I've put in my house. Um, the next slide, please. So one path to get to 80% reduction in fossil fuels, 80% of 920 would be 736 tons. The electricity goes to zero, we save 377 tons. If we reduce gasoline usage by 40%, as we replace vehicles, we save 61 tons. If we replace our conventional diesel fuel with um, biodiesel, we can save 139 tons. And if we can save 60% of our fossil fuels from building heat, we would be down 146 tons. So we're getting, that, gets, that adds up to 723 which is very close to 736. It's close to an 80% reduction. This is the path that, that we see as a feasible path for the town to follow. Next slide. So the, the, uh, ele the electricity goes to zero, um, actually by 2030, not by 2025. And then we can, um, within 10 years, we can get gasoline usage down by 40%. Within 10 years, we can get building heat down by 60%. And with, as soon as we want to do it, we can bring diesel usage down by replacing diesel with biodiesel. Next slide. So, you know, we've been thinking about this a lot. We would really like to see the town set a goal of an 80% reduction in carbon dioxide generation from fossil fuels by the year 2030. And this is this is what we are requesting of the of the uh, select board. So thanks for your attention. And Howard and I would be glad to answer questions. And I think Ross Conrad may also be on the line if we have questions about biodiesel. He's our biodiesel expert. I do want to say too, not to overlook all the work that I mean. This really, as a committee, there were lots of great discussions in our committee. I mean, Richard did a lot. Of, is the number cruncher. But um, really, this is a, a group effort, and everyone's done a great job getting to where we are now. Brian, I had a couple of questions. I think you're muted. Is okay if I? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so um, the first question I had was I know, and maybe Ross would be better able to answer this. I know a number of years ago, there was an attempt to move into biodiesel um, and there were some uh, suppliers that attempted to make that happen. Uh, I think there were some gelling issues. Um, and as of late, I haven't really heard of much availability of biodiesel in our area and for our climate. So could you comment on, maybe I'm just not aware. So I'm just curious if there's more information out there. Sorry, that catches me on my background. And I, and I see that Ross is on now. So I'm sure he, he would be the one to try to address that. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so you're right, Heather. Uh, um, biodiesel in cold weather will tend to gel much more readily than regular diesel, uh, which is why it's typically blended with regular diesel. Um, and that will help to eliminate that. 
Um, so you can get some reduction in uh, CO2 emissions that way, but you get even more if you add an additive um, and it comes in a little you know, quart bottle. Um, you have to remember every time you're fueling up to add the additive, but there's anti-gelling additives that you can add. The only real issues um, other than that um, with biodiesel in fuels that I'm aware of is that it tends to uh, clean out any sludge that's in the fuel system, if it's especially in older vehicles. And so you may have to uh, replace the fuel filter an extra time or two as the sludge is getting loosened up and removed through the fuel system because of use of biodiesel. But other than that, um, all the vehicles today can run on biodiesel and they're, they're made for it. I'm not totally sure about uh, you know farm vehicles. I think Brian would be the one to, to answer that one. Um, and like big, big uh, heavy machinery and that type of thing. But I believe they can all, should be able to manage it. If not, certainly a blend. Yeah, and Ross, can you speak to the, uh, what you found in terms of availability? Oh, right. Um, yeah, there's a company here in Vermont, there's several companies in Vermont, but the biggest one, been around for like 70 years, Bourne's Energy. They supply all kinds of fuels, um, but one of the things they supply is biodiesel that they actually, make from fuel uh, vegetable oil that they collect from local re restaurants throughout the state. And they also buy it from other companies that make it as well. So if this is, because biodiesel produced from you know food, which would be like virgin corn, doesn't have that big a CO2 benefit, quite frankly, because of the, uh, all the energy used to produce the corn. But if it's used as food and it's a waste product and they're throwing it away, that's where you can capture, you know, you're using a waste product basically as a fuel, and then you can really uh, get the benefits of uh, greenhouse gas reduction that way. And so they've, they've been, I, I actually was talking to them. Um, they would be happy to supply the town of Middlebury and the amounts that, of diesel that we use. Um, and throughout their history, recently, um, they actually had to stop uh, buying the vegetable oil uh, used vegetable oil based biodiesel and get some of the regular biodiesel that was on the market because the restaurants closed and the supply of w waste grease from the fryers kind of dried up a bit. Um, I was talking to them, they said that's only the second time in their, their history that they've been selling biodiesel that they've had to actually go on the market and buy regular biodiesel. So um, they're, they're pretty good, you know, it's, it's all up to the economy. There's other factors that we have no control over, but. Um, it, it seems like they're, they're a pretty solid company. They're local. Um, over, uh, they've got three locations actually in Vermont. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate that. Thanks, uh, Ross. I, I think we'd have to check with manufacturers, Ross, on heavy equipment. Some of them have. Uh, come out against it, at least during the warranty period, because they don't want to be responsible for quality and stuff like that. Um, and, but, uh, you know, will it burn it? Yes. So. <clears throat> it might be something that would require some changing of equipment. Other questions? I have another quick one if Please. no one else does. Um, Richard, would you mind explaining to someone who just doesn't know um, what the difference is between a plug-in hybrid and an electric vehicle? Yeah. Um, so an ordinary hybrid has both a gasoline motor and an electric motor. And it uses the electric motor when it has enough battery power and <laughs> uses the and when when the battery runs low it runs on the gas basically um, the gasoline the, the operation of the vehicle charges the battery just like it does in any other car so the 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 the, the operation of the, the 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 brakes actually the energy involved in braking is actually transferred back to the battery as well that you can imagine that instead of charging the, the, the electric part of your hybrid from your gasoline motor, you plug it in, you plug it into the wall and you charge your 
battery from your house electric or from a charging station. That way you get a fuller battery and you can drive more miles without needing to use the gasoline. Um, Steve Meyer, who uh, some of you know, um, who's on our, on our energy committee, um, says that you know, he hasn't bought gasoline since February. Um, and it, you know, you just, if you're just driving locally, you plug your car in every time the battery gets low, then the gasoline never comes on. And at that, at that point, it's functionally an electric car, but you always have the, the reserve that if you have to drive further and you run out of electric charge, then you can run on the gasoline. <coughs> Thank you. I just, I didn't understand the distinction between the, when it was plug in, when, uh, but I get it now. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Other questions? Dan? All right. My question is being the new guys, what's the next step for us? What, what do we, what do we do as a, as a board? How do we consider this and, and um, what do we do to move forward? Kathleen. I'm not sure that question is for me. I think it's for your fellow yeah, board members. Absolutely. That's what I, yes. Thank you. Okay. Kat, Kathleen, uh, I know that we sought uh, department head feedback. Was that, uh, did we s circulate this brief to get the feedback or uh, what did they have in their hands? Yes, we circulated this document uh, to get their feedback. We've, we circulated a couple of drafts, actually. So one uh, potential route uh, forward, uh, given that there are some uh, significant investments involved, uh, suggesting that we take it to the infrastructure committee for their review um, from a, on a financial and um, timing lens. Uh, <coughs> yeah, the whole, in, looking at the big picture uh, for the next year, for the next uh, capital budget. Thoughts? I, if, if I may point out that most of what you proposed involves making CO2 aware decisions every time existing equipment needs to be replaced. Yeah, so would the assumption be that it's a case by case basis that you know when heating systems come due and vehicles come due that each of those would go to the infrastructure committee uh, as as one you know uh, individually one just quickly one concern I have about sending it to the infrastructure committee now is um, we're going to start looking at the capital budget and our October meeting. Um, we may possibly have a um, second meeting in October to keep on schedule with budgeting. Um, so we may not be we may not be able to look at it until maybe December, right, Kathleen? Um, so that just something to keep in mind schedule wise. I think right now we're tracking to have three board meetings in October as well. Is that correct, Kathleen? Yes. Um, Farhad. Yeah, um, I, I don't know, but I keep cutting in and out during this whole presentation, so I might not have the right question, but uh, uh, this is for Richard and uh, Howard. Um, you said that uh, after all these changes are done, our monthly consumption is about, uh, not, uh, not the consumption, but the price will be about the same or a little bit lower. But did you factor the upfront cost of uh, replacing all these things? Maybe I missed that part, but. Again, I just to, to reemphasize that mostly we're replaced, we're what well, we're urging. Mm -hmm. We, th we think that a viable path forward involves replacing equipment with uh, non-fossil fuel using equipment as it wears out. Okay, 
Now, there, we are not experts on the marginal costs. Could it, you know, if, you, you know if, we, if we look at the police station, is it gonna cost more to um, replace the existing uh, propane burning uh, or natural gas burning heaters in the police station with uh, cold climate heat pumps than it would to simply buy new natural gas burning uh, devices. And, and that's what we've, that's what we've hired, who we're, we're hiring a consultant to help us understand that better. Whether, um, what, whether there's a marginal increase or perhaps even a marginal decrease uh, in the price and the replacement price of going with a, with a low CO2 alternative. We, we, we don't, we don't, we're, we're uh, doctors and professors and, and uh, beekeepers and lawyers. And you know, we, do, we don't necessarily claim to be experts on, on, the, on the economics of, of uh, building heating systems. We're trying to learn, but we're not experts yet. But I, but I do think all of that should be factored in when we're making these decisions, right? So right. as we're replacing a heating system, well, let's take a simple example, the hybrid that uh, Chief Henley purchased. Although it's more upfront, you know, the lower fuel costs, it balances out over the life of the vehicle. Um, you know, and with heating, as Richard said, we don't really know what it would cost at this point. But if it, you know, so I think the initial cost along with lifetime cost of, of that heating system would probably be factored in. And, and our recommendation as an energy committee would be, even if it's a little bit more, it's, you know, there's, there's a cost of, of generating carbon, you know, and so we'd, we would want that factored in and would, would expect that a little bit more cost would be worth it for, for those things. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, Brian, I just have a question. Um, you know, the, the title of this presentation is setting a goal for CO2 reductions for in town operations. And um, I know, you know, uh, we're going to start looking at 2022 budgets and things like that. Um, I, I think it's it's a bigger picture. It's not just looking at next year's budget or the year after that's budget. It's it's looking to the future and trying to decide whether we can we can set a goal. Um, I, don't, I don't think we need to wait till 2023 or 25 to s set a goal. Um, we, we need some type of process to look at what, where we want to be, what we want to do. And if it's, if there's any possibility that in the future for the next 10 years, that we can achieve this and, 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 and set that goal. So, I mean, it's, it's easy to set a goal. We can make a motion and vote on it right now and say we've got that. But, but I, I think instead of just specifically looking at next year and, and we, we, we need to be looking further out and whether we want, as a community, want, want to set this goal. Um, it's, um, I, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be that difficult uh, to me to, to be able to say yes or no. And um, it's hard to say no, but. And I, and I, and and that's a process I'm looking for. Not the, you know, not saying you know what we, what can we buy next year or the year after that, but just to get this goal on, and then then working towards that every year, so trying to address what percentage of that goal we can achieve per year. Well, it does. Oh, yeah. It does seem to me. We have a, a crisis on our hands, an environmental crisis, and um, I think there's an imperative that we move in this direction. It's not a matter of saying it would be a good policy overall or economically, or so on and so forth. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a much more critical problem. So um, I think the sooner that we can begin setting ourselves ourselves goals that reduce uh, carbon emissions, um, the better off the health of the community is going to be. And um, therefore, it, it does seem to me that um, uh, we ought to be thinking about this. In other words, it's not simply a matter of 
of deciding what our budget is going to be next year. It's deciding uh, really on a much larger problem. And uh, I mean, if you just go and look at the at the uh, town waterfall, I think uh, the fact that we haven't had rain and, and that uh, climate change is ex is affecting us in, in a in a very bad way. Uh, that uh, there is something there are things we need to do, and I think what Richard is proposing is um, it sets a rational plan uh, before us that we can think about beginning to implement. And I think we ought to be moving in that direction. We'd be foolish not to. I agree. It's really adopting a philosophy with a defined goal. You know, I think it's what we're really asking. No. Lindsay? Yeah, I was just gonna add, what I really like about this plan is it sort of, it takes out that, um, it takes out the ambiguity, you know, it, um, climate change is one of those situations where everything needs to happen right now. It needed to happen 10 years ago. And I think that it's hard to feel like you're moving forward or it's hard to uh, quantify how much you're moving forward. And so I really like that this plan lays out a path forward. It lays out different routes to get there um, in a very pragmatic way. So even if we set a goal and don't quite achieve it, we can still sort of quantify how much uh, how much progress we're making? So I'm I'm in favor of of uh, setting a goal. <laughs> All right. and, and, and you know the the, the items that are addre the the processes addressed here is not is not unrealistic. Uh, and every business should be that. I mean, today I I uh, installed two new heat pumps in in one of our and one of our uh, one of our buildings. Um, that's uh, Two of the three buildings I have under heat pumps. I replaced my air conditioning system in my house this summer because it needed replacing because it was 20 years old and I replaced it with heat pumps. I drive a plug-in uh, hybrid car and I buy 50% of my energy uh, from uh, solar power. It's it's it was it's easy. I mean it it, it was a, it was a no-brainer just to do those things because this cost savings are going to be significant with these with these heat pumps. And if if it wasn't for one trip to um, to Maine for a weekend to see a friend. Um, I filled my hybrid up in February and and once, uh, at, you know, in um, in July. So it, it, th these are all logical, easy steps that any business should take, and we are a business. And 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 setting that goal, um, I've never quantified a goal for my business, but I just had a goal of being more energy efficient because there's only way to make money one way to make money is reduce costs for us one way to save money is to reduce costs so. just just uh, to put a little per better perspective on that I, I don't think this is a saving money plan Dan <laughs> no no well I mean, no what, what I'm but yeah but what I'm saying is we're gonna have to replace equipment I mean and we're gonna have to put in new heating systems Right. And we, we'd be foolish not to consider these, and I'm sure we will when we do it. And and that would be process of that. Yeah. Just just so you know, we already have. This is a requirement when we look at replacement of systems that we look at energy efficient methods. And and so this is nothing new. This is this is taking what we had been doing in the past couple of years. This is that is relatively new in just in the past couple of years, and that's why we now have our first. Uh, hybrid police vehicle is because of the process and, and requests that came to us through the, uh, you know, through this committee. So, um, and that's great. We, I, I totally get it. And that my, I'm just going to voice my only concern is, is, is uh, um, you know, we still are at that 80% reduction. It got pushed out a couple of years, but, and, and you know, Heather's comment had been, uh, you got to start somewhere is where the goal, and if that's the philosophy of the committee, uh, of the board, then I, you know, I, then that's where we go. I just, I look at this and I just wonder um, how can we, can we quantify what those additional costs are replacing major systems, uh, 
and and we still have, we haven't answered if our uh, you know there's 139 tons of, from reduction of diesel. I think that there's a lot of great work here. I'm just not sure I'm ready to vote personally on it because so, um, I don't know if our if our diesel burning equipment is cleared for biodiesel, for instance. And so, but um, I, that's just me as a board member, so. Well, I think, I, I, I certainly think um, for me as a board member, I, I, I understand that we don't need to make a vote right now, but what I would like to see us to do is to press forward um, to be able to, in some reasonable amount of time, make a decision on w whether it's it's a feasible goal that we could that we could set. I mean, obviously, you've already indicated that there's a philosophy that we're uh, basically looking at energy consumption and everything we do. So we're obviously looking at reducing our carbon f footprint in that manner. Um, I, I just think it'd be a good idea at some time to either say yes or no, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. And if it's not 80%, maybe it's 50%, but um, I, I, I really like their plan and I think we owe it to them to make some type of decision on this at, at some point. Oh, I don't, don't disagree with you there, Dan. <coughs> Certainly uh, this, this gets me a lot closer to the, a lot closer to the point where I'm, where I'm comfortable with it. So I, okay. Well, I think it's useful. Uh, I think one suggestion was made um, that the staff consider it and um, um, how we might move in this direction. I think there's no question that we have to move in this direction. Uh, and um, the, uh, that it, it might be well to have the, um, the staff consider this. I mean, they're the ones who uh, really uh, are operating the equipment and uh, <coughs> for it, I think uh, it would be helpful to have them come back to us with some kind of a plan on how we can move in this direction. Uh, uh, whether we whether we adopt to the you know the uh, it's one thing to say well we've got the eighty percent and, and and the time limit and so on and so forth. The point is, is that what Richard has, has shown is that there is a rational path for carbon re reduction of carbon emissions. And, um, and, and I think it's imperative that we begin moving in that direction. A motion tonight is not going to move us in that direction, I think. No, I agree. Uh, but, uh, but certainly, uh, uh, let's say I think we should we should refer it to Kathleen and Kathleen to the staff as a way of getting a some kind of a perspective and, and how we would look if we work in that direction. Brian, I think uh, Richard has a comment. Okay. Did you say good? Uh, I I I I'm I'm pleased that 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 you mentioned that the uh, that we do have an existing purchasing policy and that the infrastructure committee has been following that policy. Um, I just there's an aphorism in government that what gets measured gets done. If you don't measure it, it doesn't happen. Not just in government, Richard. <laughs> okay, but what gets measured gets done. We want we we the energy committee would like to see the town committed to doing an annual measurement to measure its progress towards a numerical goal. And the energy committee is committed to doing the measurement? Yep. Okay. Lindsay? Yeah, I was just gonna add to, I mean, in terms of um, measuring things, you know, I feel like the general public comes to us a lot looking for progress and I think not measuring things means that the progress that we have made gets lost a lot of the times. Uh, I find that some people understand what we've done and are very proud of what we've done and some people are not aware. Um, so I think another benefit of, of setting a goal and, and showing that progress publicly is that people in the town 
know what kind of progress we're making and can feel invested in it. Yeah, I'd love to know what kind of credits we get moving from the prior town offices to the current town offices. Yeah. So, that must have been almost a 50% for the town. Is there uh, any kind of consensus here on a direction? Uh, what our next step is on trying to move this this <laughs> forward to come up to a, an agreement on time frame and end goal. Unless you want to, unless somebody's going to make a motion tonight. So. Well, I, I would like, as I say, to have the staff consider uh, the proposals made by Richard and, and, and see how they might be implemented. I also would like, uh, uh, I realize the infrastructure committee is busy with budget, but this is, to a certain extent, partly a budgetary matter in, in the sense that uh, I would think that the infrastructure committee ought to be able to weave this into their considerations. They certainly ought to be considering what's been proposed tonight. Okay. Looking to next year's budget, which uh, uh, as far as infrastructure concerned is going to be involved the, um, <laughs> the use of the greatest amount of energy. So um, it should go to both those groups and uh, we should ask for recommendations in the form of policies. Um, uh, I mean, I, we just can't say this is a this is a good report and 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 let it stand. I think it it needs to move forward. So, as as the board has said, uh, the um, energy committee has done a fantastic job in laying out a reasonable path. I think we just have to, I think we're very close to moving forward. I think we just have to um, track down a couple of these details about the timing of the heat pump replacements and the biodiesel in particular, find out where we are in that. And I, I, I think we could report back uh, from both the infrastructure committee and the staff uh, by early December. I think that's that's reasonable, Kathleen. And uh, that that would put us on uh, the board on track for doing something, adopting a goal by the end of the year. That would be something we could report at the town meeting then. That'd be great. Good. So, Thank you, Kathleen. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna put that in your hands, Kathleen, to uh, to get out and and task staff to. <laughs> this in their particular departments with the action items that uh, are given looked at by department but not just those specific action items are there other things that that maybe uh, are are achievable if, if some of these aren't and then we can get it back to, to Howard and Richard and the committee to, to crunch the numbers and see what kind of a reduction that would give us Okay. All right. Well, then uh, we'll, uh, if it comes back to the board, then uh, we'll let you know what that meeting time is because we, uh, and we'll get it, we'll get it back to you ahead of that meeting, ahead of that board meeting uh, so that hopefully you can be there uh, to discuss it with us. Okay. Uh, we'll also certainly let you know whenever we get it uh, fitted into the infrastructure committee agenda too, so you guys can join us and answer questions and participate in that conversation too. All right. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Howard, <laughs> and the entire energy committee, and 
this is this is a step forward from from our last uh, discussion, and it does look like we're making some some progress on understanding how it how it goes. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, and then we need Dana. Then uh, Chris to join us. Hey, okay, Dana's on her way, and I'm bringing Joe in right. Hi. You hear Dana? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, there she is. There she is. Yeah. You can see me. Well, I can yeah. see myself, so I assume nope, you can, I can see, see you. Me. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well. Hi. Uh, thanks for making time to see me tonight. I'm really excited to get to talk with you about going fine free because usually when I'm in front of the select board, I'm talking about a facilities related issue, which is always important and necessary, but kind of out of my area of expertise. And um, tonight I get to talk about a real library issue that is much more in my wheelhouse and, um, and is something I believe in very deeply. So um, so I'm happy to, to get to talk about going fine free. I started talking about going fine free with the library trustees about a year ago. Um, and after a couple of conversations with the staff and the library board, um, the trustees decided to endorse my proposal to go fine free. I had planned to present the proposal and report and get input from uh, the select board back in March or April. And of course, when um, the pandemic happened, everything just kind of got pushed way to the back burner. Um, so I will quickly go through uh, what it means to be fine free and why libraries make that decision. And then maybe um, if you have any sort of general questions, I can answer those and then I can talk about the budget. Um, and if you were able to read the report that was included in the board packet, some of it might sound a little familiar, but I just want to make sure we're all on the, the same page about some of the, the big picture ideas. So a fine free library is one that does not assess fines for materials returned past their due date. And it's really important to distinguish between fees and fines. So fees are what you pay when you lose a book or you kind of damage it beyond um, it being able to be used again. And fines are what you pay when you return something late. So fines are really more of a punitive measure. They're not actually replacing anything. Um, and that's what I'm talking about when I say going fine free. I'm talking about eliminating the fines, the overdue fines, but keeping the fees if someone loses or, or steals a library book. Um, there's been a trend to go fine free for the past decade or two. Um, in fact, Ilsley is the only library in Addison County that still assesses fees. Um, and libraries make the decision to go fine free because many, many studies have shown that fines actually end up being a barrier to access. So they can prevent people from using the library. Um, and they especially impact low income families and children. So at Ilsley, when someone reaches a minimum of $5 in fines, and of course you can accrue more than $5 in fines, there's, I mean, the sky's the limit, but when you reach the $5 threshold, um, your account is frozen and you can't check out any new materials um, until you get your fines back below $5. Even if you return the materials, you still have to get the fines back under $5. And this is a huge problem because, you know, for a lot of people, for the people that have the hardest time paying the fines, those are the people that generally need to use the library the most. Um, we know that if some, for a lot of people, if they reach that $5 threshold, um, it's easier for them to just let their card expire and stop using the library altogether than to get their fines back under $5. When that happens, you know, we're not getting the books back either way. Um, if someone stops using the library, they're never gonna return those overdue books and we end up paying the replacement fee anyways. Uh, but the bigger loss in that scenario is obviously that the patron stops using the library, uh, which is the opposite of what we want. We want to get more people in the library um, and more books and materials out into the community. And going fine free really does get people back into the library. Uh, time and time again, libraries that go fine free report that they have 
both higher patrons um, and higher circulation overall. They also report um, better relationships between the patrons and the staff members. And I can't stress how wonderful and important this is enough. Um, I can tell you from personal experience how absolutely terrible it is to tell an adorable young child that just spent half an hour picking out books and they're all excited to go home and, and read that actually no, they can't take those books out today unless their parent or guardian can get their fines back under $5, which um, for some of our community's most vulnerable residents, um, that just isn't always an option. Uh, it's heartbreaking to have to have those conversations when we have to deny a community service to someone because they make a really simple, basic human error. Uh, it's really, it's a lose-lose situation. Um, the patron is upset and embarrassed and disappointed. The staff member is disheartened and uncomfortable. Some often it can become contentious, and um, and I, I really just think we can do better for our community. Um, so I can go on and on about all the wonderful things about being fine free, um, but I know we don't have a ton of time. Um, the last thing I'll say that is kind of relevant to where we are at this particular point in time um, is that libraries always see an increase in use during um, periods of economic hardship. Um, this is just kind of a universal truth that when the economy is not doing well, people rely more heavily on um, the library and other public services, I assume. But I think it's safe to assume that over the next few years, as, um, as the state and local economy recover from the pandemic, uh, Middlebury residents are going to have both an increased need for the library and also, um, you know, a decreased capacity to pay for fines at the same time. So that's just something to keep in mind. But the bottom line is um, fines really do present um, a barrier to access and eliminating them really does create more equitable service. Um, again, especially for low income people and for children. So before I talk about the budget, um, does anyone have questions about, about how being fine free works or, or what this would look like at Ilsley? Okay, I will just ro roll right into the budget and then if there's more questions at the end, we can take them as they come. Um, so where we are, I'll tell you where we are right now with the budget um, or the anticipated revenue from fines. Uh, when we closed the public back in March, we stopped assessing fines temporarily because we were not accepting returns. Um, now we are accepting returns, but we're still not assessing fines. The reason for that is because um, even though we're accepting returns, we're quarantining the books and other library materials before we check them in and put them back on the shelf. So we don't want people essentially uh, incurring fines for materials that they've already returned. You know, they're, they're sitting in the building. We just haven't checked them in and processed them yet. So for last fiscal year and this fiscal year, our revenue from fines is going to be below what we anticipated, but we'll be able to offset that with um, savings from other um, budget lines in our operating budget, um, excuse me, um, specifically from our work study and, um, and substitute budget lines. But uh, when we go fine free as a matter of policy, that revenue stream from fines will obviously cease to exist. Um, right now, we anticipate about $9,000 in fine revenue annually. That number has been going down pretty much every year for at least the past decade. And I think I talked about this um, with the select board maybe two years ago when I did my budget presentation. Um, the downward trend is in keeping with what's happening in libraries across the country. Um, and a big reason for this is because the circulation of digital materials is going up relative to the circulation of physical materials. Digital materials cannot accrue fines because they're returned automatically, which is wonderful. Um, libraries, as you know, are not designed to be revenue producing entities. And we do not have another potential uh, revenue source to, to replace this one. Um, what we can do to kind of manage the revenue reduction is to potentially phase it out over multiple years. Uh, I presented a couple different options in the memo that was in your packet. Um, if there's others that we wanna talk about, I'm happy to consider them. 
But um, yeah, so as you can see, the first option, I think Kathleen is sharing the screen, um, would be going completely fine free in fiscal year 22. Um, obviously, this would be the most appealing from a purely mission um, standpoint. Um, but we could also phase it out over two years by going fine free for youth um, first and then fine free for adults in the subsequent year. Um, and we could also, of course, push it out and then phase it in, which is probably the most appealing from a, from a budget standpoint. Um, so, you know, the trustees and I understand and appreciate that, um, that the revenue from fines contributes, uh, albeit in a small way, to the town's overall revenue. And you have the, the big picture understanding of the town's budget and what a, a reduction of $9,000 a year would mean. So what I'm really looking for from the select board is, is input or a recommendation on, on what schedule you think would best balance this um, sort of a mission driven decision with the realities of the town's budget. I don't think we ever thought of the library as a revenue producing institution. It's like having a school. I mean, you don't charge for it. And um, I rather I like your plan. Um, uh, and I suppose as someone who uses libraries, I suppose I'm notorious in the sense that I don't return books, but fortunately, I can take them out forever. But uh, people don't have that privilege. And I, I, I think um, I think we should leave it to you what you think is the way to, to best the best way to to institute this the purpose for which you're doing it is to encourage the use of the library and i think that's the right purpose and therefore i i would leave it to your judgment really not to ours this is not a major shift in our budget it seems to me that that's my opinion at any rate Heather? So I'm, I'm supportive of the plan and I just would like to say that I thought it was a uh, fabulously laid out presentation and information. Um, it really, so, so I, I have to admit I am notoriously late in returning my books, but I have always considered my fines to the library as like my donation to the library. So one thing I'll need to know is I still want to support the library, so I'll need another way to pay my my fines, <laughs> so that I can still continue to support the library. Um, but anyway, um, I would be supportive of moving in this direction, and I think maybe um, if we did an extra little um, fundraising campaign to the community, we could maybe make up that nine thousand dollars pretty quickly. Um, so that another option to consider i think in your budget plan is just making a a call out to the public to see if if they might you know in the first year if we went with option one to phase it out completely you know could we get people to make up half of it in in the one year and maybe a quarter of the next year and then you know go anyway it's just a thought joe uh if, if I could chime in here for a minute, uh, I think that Dana and um, Kathleen would tell you that the actual money that comes in in fines to the library doesn't actually go to support the library. Is that right? Well, it goes, Kathleen can answer better than I can, but I think it goes into the, the general fund. I don't know what exactly it goes yes, into. All, all of our revenues go into the general fund. Yeah. Oh. It does go to help and balance the budget, though, Joe. So uh, I've got two. Farhad? Yeah, I'm. if we are the only library in the Addison County left that is charging fines, it's about time we catch up with the rest of the community, I think. So I support. Um, I think we lost Farhad. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, my question is: is this is this a board decision, or is this a trustee's decision, or are you just are, are we just looking for some idea that the we as a select board are in favor of this? Um, in fact, the uh, the trustees working with. Um, uh, with Dana, who of course is in close touch with Kathleen, do an initial approval of the Ilsley Library budget. We had took our first pass at our meeting uh, last week, and we would hope to uh, do a final version in our October meeting. We thought that as this has an impact uh, on the uh, revenue for the town, yeah. that we would uh, give you a heads up and uh, just uh, see if you had any strong feelings about it. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate the, the the brief. It was it's it's very clear that this is the way that the library should be moving, and I'm fully in support of it. Lindsay, yeah, I'm I'm in agreement with everybody else. I think this is a fabulous idea, and I really appreciate that Dana um, came forward with this idea before there was this pandemic. It, you know, it was already on the table, but I think it's fortuitous that this happened because I think there are probably a lot of people in our community who really need the library right now. Um, so I, I think the timing is wonderful. I, I would support you know, whatever the, the library decided in terms of moving forward, but I'd, I'd kind of be leaning towards uh, you know, ending those fines sooner rather than later and um, figuring out how we make up that deficit. Yeah, I, um, I guess I'm the only member who hasn't chimed in. Uh, very impressive uh, presentation, well laid out. And I agree with it, with everybody. And I, I get the rationale and and am really uh, supportive of that. I do think uh, that that's not something that we would necessarily weigh in on and what, but what I see it as is an, is a request for $9,000 more in your budget. Um, because it, we're not going to tell you how to run the library. You're doing a great job doing that. And if we have to make those little decisions then uh, then we're going to really get bogged down. Um, I think it's a little premature for us to be able to say, we can give you $9,000 more in your budget, whether you have the, whether this is of higher value, than something else and and you decide to go that way um, i think it's good for the board to understand it and as we look at the budget that'll be in the back of our minds and I, and I, I i think that's where we would leave it tonight unless somebody else has something else to say but but uh, certainly a great rationale i think it's especially if it feeds uh if if uh it becomes a barrier to use in the libraries for the low income members of our community, then, then I think we need to figure out where that money comes from that would otherwise be there in the budget. And what, you know, what, what is it that we need to do without if, if that's what we have to do? But we won't know that until we look at the budget in total for the town and see where we're coming in. And this is a, it's a pretty exceptional year and so we really got to see where that where that all comes over the next couple months. But I, but, uh, now we now we know if if your budget's up nine thousand dollars, we'll know where it's coming from. And I, I would, I would tell you that if you really believe in it, you probably ought to fit, take it out of your budget. And then if we if we say you can't do that, you'll have to go to step two or step three. You, you know, because you believe in it, and that's what you're running you're running your department. So you put your budget forward with what, what you believe in. And, and then we might look at it and say, this is where you ought to take it out of, take our recommendation. But um, anyways, that, that's just my, my thoughts as a board member. But it, it's, it's good that you're thinking this way. And, and uh, we, I know everybody on the board appreciates everything you're doing there and, and the active, uh, the active uh, support that the library gets from the community, so. Well, thank you. Uh, that's all really helpful, helpful feedback. And uh, it's great to have the, the support of the select board. And um, Joe and I will take this back to the trustees and 
I'll be submitting my my budget soon enough. And we can revisit it then. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Chris, we need to get Dan in. Dan, oh, there he is. Dan, you with us? Yeah. Um, video coming up? No. No video yet. Hmm. Okay. Try that. There we go. There we go. All right. So a couple items on the agenda tonight. Um, just a brief summary of uh, some things of project updates from the infrastructure committee. Uh, the water main project out on 116 um, out by Dal Pond started about uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, they're almost done laying the pipe on the west side of 116. Uh, pretty good soil conditions, good excavations, so moving really quickly. Uh, they're probably going to fill that main with water this week and then pressure test uh, early next week. Um, for the police department reuse project, um, the uh, all the roofing old uh, concrete light uh, lightweight uh, material has been taken off the old off the old roof. Uh, looks like they're going to start putting on insulation over that control building uh, garage area this week. Um, windows look to be ready next week, and then they'll get rough electrical going. So it's starting to starting to shape up and look like a like a building. Um, one thing that the infrastructure committee will look at in October is combining the paving from the water main replacement, which is a wastewater capital budget or capital project. Uh, combining the pavement, paving with that water main replacement and the trench paving that was gonna be for part of the building reuse. So basically because of the timing of these two projects, the way they're happening, um, we, um, had discussion with a con our, the subcontractor who was doing the paving for both projects. So instead of doing trench paving for these two, we would combine them together and do a complete asphalt uh, replacement in some areas. So in other words, the worst part of the build of that area down there would be repaved with new asphalt completely. The cost to do that is cheaper than trench paving. So there would be some, there would be an additional cost, but it'd be a much, much, much better prod, pro, uh, product at the end. We'll get into that at the infrastructure committee. Um, so for the reuse project, I have a few change orders that I need to have you approve. And just to point out in the, um, uh, the motion, it has all these different change orders and numbers. What really needs to be is change order number four. Um, these three separate ones come as uh, possible change orders from the contractor. And then when we get to final final uh, process, it's the, the next subsequent change order of the bunch. So this is technically change order four. So I'll, I'll go through those. So the first part of that is um, a change order for the reinforcement of the north wall of the, uh, which will become the, the cruiser parking garage. Um, in the original bid, they allowed for, a, uh, we asked for, I should say, an alternative fee uh, or a cost, I should say, of $17,000 for the um, reinforcement of that wall. Uh, we couldn't really tell what was needed until the roof came off so we could look inside the wall. Uh, Anyway, the short story is they're going to reinforce the wall with a uh, half inch pressure treated ply on the inside surface of that wall. And so instead of a possible $17,000 cost, it now is only $4,344. The second uh, part of the change order is as a deduct. And this is for uh, eliminating the one by three inch wood strapping, which would be on the underside of the cruiser garage roof, basically attached to the underside of the rafters. Um, they're, we're going to decide, we decided to screw the plywood directly um, to the underside of those roof trusses, similar to what you would do in your house with drywall if you have a ceiling. Um, the reason for that is we wanted to get a little better clearance for the overhead door rails um, that are in that building. So that's a deduct of $1,141. The third portion of the change order is a, a change to the roof structure on the south side of the storage building. Uh, that's the old uh, wastewater plant lab area. Uh, there's an area outside of that building to the south 
which was between um, the digesters. And it was, as we looked at it, we decided to move away from the original design. Um, that was gonna be a membrane over the outside deck, um, which is over, over the old base digester basement. So if you're looking at this uh, sk uh, sketch that Kathleen has up here now, um, if you look at letter C and to the left of letter C is um, another almost square uh, hashed um, area. That area, those two areas are gonna get a complete roof from the south wall of the control building, which is about along where letter D is, and then going western or going southerly towards letter A. So instead of having an open pit for what's where C is, that place will get all one, one uh, roof with wooden roof rafters. Um, we had concerns over the having to put a railing around the, the, the curvature of those old tanks that have been knocked down. Uh, so, you know, nobody could fall in there or an animal would fall in there. Um, yes, deer, and there are snakes that do get in there occasionally. Um, and um, also there's, a, there's an en old entrance door by uh, letter D um, from the old lab uh, area inside the building. So basically someone could have jumped that wall down in there and had ac free access, I shouldn't say free access, but access to that, to that whole building without anyone ever seeing them down there for whatever time they wanted to, to be there. So anyway, we decided to do a whole roof to get rid of all those problems. Um, so that change order um, for the single roof is $5,575. So combining all of those um, possible change orders into what I'm gonna call a change order four, the um, amount for the change order is $8,778. So I need, request the board to approve change order four for that amount. I'll make a motion to approve change order number four for the police department reuse project for a total cost, uh, net cost of $8,778. Second. Moved and seconded. All in, are there any questions on this before we vote? All in favor, signal the thumbs up. Okay, continue down. Okay, the next item is uh, a little brief discussion about the preliminary engineering report for the wastewater uh, treatment facility. Um, so Tata and Howard has, has prepared a almost 90, little 90 plus page report for the, uh, for the wastewater plant. It serves a few functions. One, the state wants to see this review we all need it for, for uh, our review and, and a plan going forward. And then for any other entity that might be, you know, wanting to grant us money in the future, uh, they'll want to see the report too. So uh, Dexter came via Zoom meeting and uh, gave a presentation to the infrastructure committee. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail in it. It's, it's quite extensive, but the first 50 pages are approximately is, is what are the, what are the the uh, you know the loadings to the plant and flow and BOD and suspended solids, et cetera? And then also what do we have? In other words, how does what do we have for process process down there and how does it work? Um, the, the other half, the second half of the report is is about a discussion of what are the options for moving forward with um, uh, improvements to the plant. Uh, and that's where you might want to spend more time uh, when you have a chance to review it. Um, the infrastructure minutes that, or infrastructure committee minutes that Beth, that Beth prepared are really quite excellent. Um, uh, she captured the presentation very well. And so there's um, about three pages of, uh, four pages of notes uh, in the infrastructure committee meeting minutes that go through the process. Um, uh, that we want to look for. Um, so basically, here they are. Um, the uh, the main one of the main things we want to look at is a, is a primary clarifier, and what that does, it's at the head of the plant, um, and it removes most of the the higher organic solids that come into the plant, and then those can be taken out and used it for anaerobic digestion. And I'll get into that in a minute. And so if you wanna use an anaerobic digester for energy production, 
uh, for methane burning, you need to have the primary clarifiers. So one thing is, of course, the primary clarifier. The second is how do we, what process do we use to aerate, um, aerate the, uh, the wastewater and create the environment for the, the um, uh, you know, for biological reduction? Um, and they're proposing, um, uh, and, you know, aeration and, um, and, and settling. Uh, somewhat similar we have now, but a significant, a significant difference is we have sequential batch reactors. The key word is batch. Um, so there are four tanks down there now. And, and they all operate individually, uh, cycle through the day. And because of that, they each see different loadings to them. So they're basically, you're running four different wastewater plants that then combine, um, you know, the sludge goes off to be treated, the, the clear water goes off to be uh, um, uh, disinfected. Uh, it's a little labor, laborsome uh, to, to, to manage four of those. Um, this new process would be a flow through plant. So there's basically um, a couple tanks that the flow goes through and it's one, one set of uh, uh, biology, if you will. Um, so um, much easier to, to manage, um, um, you know, with laboratory analysis and results. Um, the other portion is a uh, change in the uh, disinfection process. Right now we have, um, um, Got a brain cramp. Um, UV um, at the plant. Uh, that thing is due for upgrade. Uh, we're kind of uh, in a corner with limited uh, bulb availability. The electronics need to be upgraded. Uh, things go obsolete in 20 years. Um, it's a high energy um, uh, consumption process. Uh, we're proposing to do go with chlorine disinfection. Uh, yes, you're spending um, uh, more money in, on on uh, chemicals, but nowhere near the amount that we would for uh, UV. In the report, there's um, uh, an, an analysis, some of the tables, and towards the back of the report, uh, I think the energy cost for uh, UV was fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, and we also use. Um, uh, uh, another use uh, cost to the town is the when we press the sludge is the water waste. I think the wastewater plant is in the top ten water users of, of of our entire system. So that's related to um, the sludge dewatering. So we're looking at a fan press or a screw press dewatering process um, instead of the uh, belt filter presses, which I just said use a significant amount of water. Um, so the last portion is the anaerobic digestion um, for uh, the biosolids into a class A product. Um, anaerobic digestion is, with, is anaerobic is without the use of oxygen. So um, you basically degrade the, uh, the biomass um, into um, you know, a smaller amount of sludge and methane is produced. You burn that methane in a generator and generate electricity. Um, the wastewater plant would practically be energy self-sufficient uh, with the inclusion of an anaerobic digester in the process. Um, so that basically is the, um, is the gist of where we're at right now. Um, the report has to be finalized um, and we'll run it through the state process. Uh, we'll all see it when it's finalized one last time. But it's def definitely a plan to move forward um, uh, with the process. Uh, as uh, as um, Dexter pointed out early, there's nothing down there that's critically, you know, um, uh, a critical need. Everything's working okay. Um, yeah, we'd like to get rid of those belt filter presses, you know, soon. Yes, we'd like to get rid of the UV soon, um, but it all has to be a package. And that's where um, we get through this report, then we can start looking at some grant grant uh, possibilities. So that's the gist of the report. Um, it's I know it's lengthy, um, but a good shortcut is, is to use Beth's minutes and then look for those chapters in the, in the larger, larger uh, Tata and Hour report. 
Um, Dan, additionally, if, if people just can't get enough of this report, there's also a recording of the infrastructure committee meeting that we provided. Uh, we have a YouTube link on, so we'll get that circulated as well. Yep. So there's no motion you need to make tonight um, about it. We just wanted to let you know where we're at and uh, um, continue the process going forward. Hey, Dan, um, one thing I didn't think about when we were talking about this in infrastructure committee that I've thought about since um, I just have some concerns about the chlorine and I do understand that the need to get away from the UV and the cost and the energy and the bulb sourcing, but I am concerned about the chemicals and the exposure to people, you know, to our staff in those nasty chemicals. So the only thing I would, if we're going to move towards that direction, um, as they move into the final part of their plan, can they consider uh, automatic, you know, uh, so we can limit exposure to staff to those chemicals as much as possible. Like what are the automate, you know, are there ways to automate that process with those chemicals so we aren't asking staff to handle them? Um, so if you could just communicate that, because it's something I thought about uh, since we met last, or since the infrastructure met with them. Yeah, certainly. I think we can have Dexter and or Bob just kind of give a brief, uh, you know, we can do a brief summary back to the infrastructure committee of just saying what, what's involved with that so everybody has a comfort level. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions on this, Dan? It's like some good reading there, Dan. Yes. <laughs> Grab a hot chocolate and there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're all quite welcome. Thank you. Um, what's next? Next, we're going to a uh, recommendation regarding a fourth sergeant position for the police department from the personnel committee meeting of September 8th. And what is this? Did we just lose some of our board? That's my fault, Brian. I removed the wrong Dan. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's back. I was I was looking for Dan because I he he chaired that meeting, so I, I was going to uh, I was going to see if he wants to cover this topic. Yeah. Sure, I got shut out there for a minute. My screen was blank. I was gone. <laughs> I, I I went I to had, talk to you and I couldn't. And you disappeared. <laughs> yeah, I knew it was coming, and I was running to bed, so I'm done. But yeah, you know, we had. Um, uh, our fir my first exciting personnel committee meeting, and um, and we discussed uh, what the chief's proposal to um, add a fourth sergeant. Um, I, you've you've all read about that. The chief, I think, briefed us, uh, gave us a heads up on that at the last meeting, and um, we at the committee approved this. Um, uh, it, it, it sounds like the logical thing to do to cover um, to cover the the four shifts and and not have to place a burden on the other staff members or uh, officers uh, other sergeants in um, and filling in. So um, uh, I, I think it's we think it's appropriate to approve. Questions of it? Pleasure of the board. I'll make a motion. I move to approve uh, Chief Tom Hanley's request to create the fourth sergeant position in the police department. Second. Moved and seconded. Comments or questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion for a sec the fourth sergeant position signify with a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, next, if we could get Jen and Chris. She should be on her way. Oh, there she is. She stopped for a cookie and root. Jen, you with us? She's muted. Yeah.
Hello. Hey, there you are. Hey. Hi, Jen. Well, you guys sped right along. You made some mean progress there. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> So what can I do for you tonight? Well, so explain this this agenda item. Yeah, just walk us through what you're what you're doing here. You bet. So um, you're used to us applying for a municipal planning grant almost every year. Usually, the municipal planning grant program gives the planning commission an opportunity to take on a planning project or a planning study for the year. Um, so originally, we wanted to pick up that Route Seven corridor master planning again. But when I started scoring that project, given the criteria in the funding application, it wasn't scoring very high because it's outside of a designated area, like a downtown. So I started looking at it again. You need 30 points to get an MPG grant. So you get 20 points for a downtown and you get another 10 points for choosing a project that's on their list of priorities. So this year for the first time, they're offering, um, they're saying that they would fund a, pr a priority project that was related to COVID planning or COVID um, uh, economic response. So I thought that was interesting. It's not a straight planning study, so it's not what I'm used to it, but it seems like a really good opportunity to jump at something like that. So I thought about a COVID plan and I thought, well, we already have a COVID response plan for downtown. It's our downtown master plan because you know, our downtown master plan has so many great economic recommendations in it. So I just chose a few of the economic recommendations related to uh, marketing and promotion in downtown. And I ran them past the, the funding agency, ACCD, and they thought it looked really good and really was you know, in alignment with their, their funding priorities. So that's what you have in your packet today. Okay, and do we need to make a motion on this, Kathleen, to support it or? Uh, yes, please. There, there is a motion to um, support the municipal resolution for the, the the resolution for the planning grant. Okay. Questions of Jen? If not, if I could get somebody to make the motion. I'll make a motion to approve the submission of an application for a twenty-two thousand dollars. FY 2021 municipal planning grant application, including a local match commitment of $2,200 to fund the development of marketing and promotional materials, including maps, brochures, logo and branding, conference guide and promotional marketing strategies as recommended in the downtown master plan. I further move to sign the municipal planning grant resolution. Second. That was a mouthful. <laughs> okay. Any questions before we vote? Or comments? Okay. Jen you, Jen, you mentioned that you've been applying for this for every year now? Yep. This, this particular grant um, round comes around every year. And it's usually for planning studies and planning projects. So this is a And how did helpful. we do? Did we get those grants every year or no? Um, we try, <laughs> we try. Okay. We, yeah, we got one uh, last year to um, create, to make some changes to the zoning um, after right. this downtown master plan to try to encourage more um, housing types in the neighborhoods surrounding downtown. So an affordable housing grant. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so all, all in forward, uh, all in favor of supporting the uh, grant request signify with thumbs up. All right, so we need to sign it. Thanks, Jen. Uh, you, you're uh, you get your plate full. We're very anxious to see the final product of the, <laughs> of the downtown master planning. As I'm sure you are anxious to have that behind you, but uh, that's that launches more opportunity for our downtown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking forward to having that back in front of you in November. I've been working hard with the planning commission and the consultant, and it looks great. I think you're going to be impressed. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear it. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, 
Let's see, next we need to go to <clears throat> follow up discussion on uh, of the community engagement on anti racism. Uh, how to solicit personnel. We wanted to talk about how we're going to slip solicit personal stories from members of the Middlebury community about their experience with racism. And um, I hope everybody got a chance to read uh, Jason Kay's uh, email on ideals recommendation. So with that, um, thoughts on our next step to solicit that. And Kathleen, I have a question for you. Um, you talked about uh, hiring someone to do, to, uh, to gather that. Are there some, any kind of funds out there to support this type of a, of a hire or you know, a consultant doing that? I attended the virtual recovery forum last Thursday night and there was a person there from the Vermont Community Foundation and they have some newly available uh, grant funding available uh, for up to $3,000 um, for this type of um, effort and I am reached out preliminarily to Jason to see if we might uh, coordinate on a grant application. I have to get all the details on that yet. Uh, their grant applications are up to $3,000. Okay. That would seem to be probably sufficient for what we're looking to do, if we could get that. What, in, any thoughts on that? That what Jason, uh, I thought ideals recommendations were solid and, and probably is, uh, a, a good next step is to create that, create that uh, information gathering uh, process, or I'm not sure what, how, to, how to call that, but, but the gathering that data and those stories and Kathleen, what, what's your thoughts on how, what's the timeline on, on something, on, on these grants typically? Can we, are they fairly quick turnaround? I think that these are a quick turnaround. Okay. Um, it is so uh, timely. Um, we should also uh, just briefly, since we're coming up on, on October, uh, the select board, two things, the select board discussed having um, Ideal Middlebury back at its October 13th meeting and uh, Jason and his group have asked uh, what type, what length of the presentation uh, the board would like to see. Uh, uh, typically our presentations are 15 to 20 minutes. Is that what you're looking for? Uh, I think uh, if they if we could do it like a 20 minute presentation, Kathleen, and then and then that gives us plenty of you know then we have time for for Q and A afterwards. A lot of times the Q and A is pretty critical to understanding of the, or you know our clarification of the presentation. Okay. Thank you. I'll let them know, uh, Lindsay. Did you have something? I did, yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, potentially getting a grant and hiring somebody to help us gather uh, information from members of our community, are we looking to have someone local or are we looking for someone outside of town? Are we, how are we going to identify that person? I think that's a great question. Um, you know, Jason suggested uh, hiring someone from uh, the Black, Indigenous, or People of Color community to collect the stories on the select board's behalf. And I think that's a great idea. Uh, I haven't identified anyone locally. Um, so perhaps the select board members know of someone or um, I Ideal Middlebury might have some suggestions. I think it would be great if we could get somebody local 
uh, to help us with that. And well, we would probably need the, the grant before we advertise for that or yeah, I don't. Um, why don't I look around and see what uh, money we might have available uh, on hand? I, I don't know what the budget would be for this particular um, piece of our uh, effort, but it would be nice to get this rolling soon as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Is there a way to do a, a solicitation for how they would gather what their proposal is and what their what their price is from a from a small group of people or let, let me look into uh, see if there's any models out there what other people have done uh, okay are, are we uh, Are, are we in a position where we say this is a where we want to be our next step and we can just and we can give Kathleen the go ahead so that if you find some you don't have to necessarily bring it back to us or unless you really aren't comfortable with it. Uh, no, I, I think that would be great if we could uh, keep this moving in parallel uh, with our plans for a select board retreat and further community outreach. Yeah, and I, I just feel like if, if it has to keep coming back for approval, I mean, we know we want to gather the information and if you can come up with some, whether you can find the funding or, or the grant funding, but it, at least uh, can, can start moving that forward between ideals gathering and an hour gathering uh, and outreach, then then we'll, we'll get a larger database and, and I think more people will be touched. And then just, uh, so I'll move forward on that, but then I'd also like to just briefly uh, touch on the idea of the select board retreat as to what the timing of that's going to be and what format uh, you're hoping for for that. I- We talked about a speaker. Or, or a facilitator. Uh, one idea I had is uh, reaching out to the some of the folks on the um, on NA double N A N N double A C P um, website that Jason gave to us to see if uh, maybe Brian, you and I could brainstorm ideas for either what a retreat would look like or what a community engagement would like it, and see if that's a two-step process or uh, a one-step process. Yeah, it was, I think the, our concept was that the retreat was going to be our education okay. and exposure to help us with the community engagement. Okay is the way I kind of envisioned it. Is that, is that okay. the board just moved around on me again? Uh, is that the way uh, the rest of the board envisions this process or Lindsay? Yeah, I, I was thinking that uh, we would have a board retreat first with a facilitator or speaker, you know, um, for our own education before we move into a more public forum. Um, I think, you know, uh, I'm glad that there's, I'm glad that we all agree that this is something we should press forward with uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, but I also think, you know, there's always the possibility of kind of getting in over your head <laughs> on this subject. And I, and I don't wanna put, I don't wanna put us in that position or put the town in that position community members in that position because I think it just causes more damage. Um, so I would I would be in favor of, you know, definitely moving forward, but making sure we're doing it at, at the right pace. So so maybe we maybe we plan the retreat as our next step then Kathleen. Yep. Okay. Uh, so last week of October uh, First week of 
November work for people as a general timeline? Yes. I'm fine with any time, yeah. That works for me too, Kathleen. Just check my calendar. Not traveling at all this year, so. I'm sorry, Kathleen, can you get those dates again? Uh, last week of October, first week of November. Okay, thank you. The only, um, I did email Anne for helping with um, the general election. So last week of October, beginning of November, just that might be. Okay. Um, mm. Depending on where she ends up with how much help and so. So why don't we, uh, I'll, I'll try to focus on the last week of October. And that's some of that's going to be dependent upon the availability of a facilitator. Okay, so I think we've given Kathleen some guidance here and Kathleen and I will work to try to continue to pull this together and, and move move forward. Uh, Kathleen, uh, if you could give us update on the budgets. So we're still early in the fiscal year, uh, still uh, tracking on target. Um, the only thing I noted in look overlooking in looking over the budget reports is that our water line repairs are more than last year, but still within uh, the budget constraints. So we don't. So we'll keep an eye on that as we go through the fiscal year. But that um, not a very meaty, thankfully, not a very meaty uh, budget report. But uh, that's all I have on that. Okay. Um, there's, we continue to kind of figure out how how we can meet. Uh, there's certainly requests for for looking at uh, a hybrid model where the board could could get uh, together and uh but broadcast through a zoom platform and, and allowing others to participate um, so we have some some there are some options that uh kathleen and chris have pulled together and kind of laid out for us uh in the in the minutes for this evening you can see what um, how that might look where if we were in the in the uh, conference room in the in the big large meeting room uh, we would all have to have our computers uh, on zoom uh, a little confused about the miking up if uh, the, I did think about that a little bit Kathleen where we are muting our mics when we're not speaking, if we did that, would that still create that feedback? If you shut off the mics in the room and then we muted our mics when we weren't speaking, would could you get by without having to have a headset on? Yeah, I, I did note that I've been in um, Zoom meetings where people have been uh, un without room mics, but just in the same room with different devices, and they did get that feedback. If they don't mute. If they or, don't mute. Yeah, yeah, it'd be critical. It would it would mean we'd have to be hyper vigilant on, the, on muting when we're not speaking and, and, and wait for the person who had just spoken to, if we're in the same room, to mute before we started speaking, or it'll, it'll be an annoying feedback. Um, so thoughts on, on wh where we, if we move, uh, if we change and how, how we change, uh, where are you, is the board interested in moving to, to a hybrid model? Who would attend? Obviously I am, I'm going to attend. I'm so frustrated in my, right now. Um, I can't in, in the present setting, I cannot participate in any capacity. 
I'm losing the whole segment sometimes. I just, my screen freezes. Um, I, I don't see a solution to what we are doing right now. It's not working for me. So even if I have to just come sit in the town office by myself, I'll do it. But uh, th this is, uh, the present situation is not working. Yeah, I, I just have um, a question. You know, I I'm, I'm usually like to be out at the forefront and doing anything first. But um, is is are there any other um, committees, boards, businesses, or is anybody having any in person? And and the, re the reason I'm asking that is um, we're comfortable with it, but we're in front of a whole bunch of people, and are those people going to be comfortable with that? Is are we ready to set the example to go forward like this? Now, I understand everybody's willingness. I'm I would really like to. Um, I'm just, just concerned about what pushback we might get from anybody else, and and reflecting on us as supporting the um, the um, staying safe. So um, I'm I am concerned about how the feedback works. Um, if I don't mute my mic and somebody else starts talking, even at home, I can, my mic will pick up, you know, it, it coming through and I can hear echoes and stuff. So I'm a little under, concerned about the logistics of people in a room all on different devices trying to have a meeting and how that works. And personally, I'm not quite ready to be in a room unless in a closed space unless we're all wearing masks and i think it would be really difficult to try to conduct a meeting taking off masks muting microphones so for those that you know i understand like farhad um his internet issues um but i think for me personally i i just i don't want to jeopardize mm -hmm. the in-person learning that my student that my uh that my students <laughs> that my kids are, are have access to right now. I know the numbers are really low in Middlebury, but I think uh, personally, I'm just not quite ready to move in that direction. So I think if it's okay with the board, I would still continue to meet um, from home on Zoom. Lindsay? Yeah, I was gonna say um, <clears throat> something similar. I, I would prefer to stay home uh, while we still have to do this on Zoom. Um, but I would fully support if other people wanted to meet in person and I certainly can appreciate the connectivity issues because I've had them. Um, I'm also really concerned about masks. I think people would need to drop their masks when they speak. I'm, I'm sure we've had people, if somebody's video isn't on, I, th I think it is harder for people to understand what that person is saying um, because I, I think we do really rely on those visual cues, even if it's just on a screen. Um, you know, so from, from that standpoint, uh, you know, I would, I would personally prefer the model that we're doing, but I think we could probably do a hybrid, hybrid model <laughs> where, um, some of us are home and some of us are in person and, and, uh, it would work. So maybe, uh, go ahead. Now, my sense, I, 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 I the, the, the description of the hybrid mo uh, 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 model really sounds like a monster to me. It seems to me that um, either we do in person, that is to say, we meet personally together, which where I, I mean, I, I, I just find it's much easier to talk about, talk with people and, and, and exchange views uh, when you're together. Um, however, um, the hybrid model doesn't do that, I don't think. And uh, 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 I think that probably this is working. We're getting used to it. Um, we may as well stay with it. And I, I certainly think, I, I mean, if, if particularly we have some people doing one thing and some people doing another. Um, that's not, it's supposed to be a gathering of the select board. 
And uh, the best way we can do that, I think, um, without being in person all there, probably is something like this. Uh, I hate to say that because I don't particularly like these kinds of meetings, but uh, I mean, we can smile at each other. <laughs> That was a mouthful, Victor. Yeah. As I know how much you dislike this, but uh, there, there's certainly some challenges to overcome given the, the, the governor's uh, mask mandate and our, you know, I don't think we can get the spacing and, and airflow that, that would make, make us be able to justify to the greater public that we're being in accordance with the governor's uh, intent without having our mask on so I, th I think if we have the conference room uh, access to it because Kathleen's there in her office and she could open it up so that a couple people who have continued problems with the connectivity could be there uh, and, and have good connectivity and maybe, maybe that's our, our next step. Is that, is that uh, fair to say that that's you know, providing the access to the facility that works for those that uh, don't have a facility at, at home? And I think if you just have two or three people in there, you can easily space 10 feet or more and, and not have to wear a mask. Why don't, why don't we try that for our next meeting? And so that for Hod and uh, I think my, maybe Nick had indicated he would go in as well. So. We should try that. Maybe steps. I think that's what is it? Uh, opening the spigot just a little bit here. <laughs> oh. <coughs> okay, uh, Lindsay, are you ready for check marks? Sure. Um, <coughs> by the authority of the select board granted on April 28th, 2020, I have reviewed and approved total expenditures of $381,477.98, consisting of $265,507.46 for accounts payable and $115,970.52 for payroll for the period of September 9th, 2020 through September 22nd, 2020. And I move the board's approval of payment of these expenditures. Second. Second it all in favor, signify with a thumbs up. Okay. Kathleen. <laughs> yeah, you're muted, Kathleen. <laughs> uh, in your packet, I provided a summary of projects eligible for Vermont Community Development uh, program funding. Um, this was a follow up to the board's request for an idea of what other things the our revolving loan funds could be used for in addition to revolving loan funds for businesses. So there are several things on that list that are directly related to recommendations coming out of the downtown master plan. So do keep in mind as Jen presents the downtown master plan to us, this is a source of funding either uh, and could be used to leverage larger grants from the Vermont Community Development Program. Uh, in the past, we have used our revolving loan funds to leverage uh, grants for affordable housing, particularly. Um, the North Pleasant Street project uh, was received a generous grant from the Vermont Community Development Program for that. And um, so there are a lot of potential uses for that. Um, reporting on the September 15th meeting of the Vermont Traffic Committee, uh, with thanks to 
East Middlebury residents, Tim Page and mm -hmm. others um, for preparing an excellent presentation to the traffic committee and from testimony from Chief Hanley, speed limits on K Street were reduced from 35 miles an hour to 30, mi I'm sorry, from 40 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour and on East Main Street from 35 to 30 miles an hour. And then uh, finally, um, looking ahead to our October 13th meeting, um, we, we do have a couple of heavy agendas coming up. And I just wanted to give you a heads up on that um, from the town manager's report. And that's all I have. Thanks, Kathleen. Is that meeting scheduled for four hours or? Okay. Don't laugh. <laughs> Board member concerns, Victor? Nothing. Nothing. Lindsay? I was just going to say we are now a family of all Americans. Oh, yay! <laughs> yeah. hey. And we have two voting members in our family now. So we're very excited. Yeah, we awesome. need all the help we can get. <laughs> and you have cats. I do, and being a cat, she very much knew I didn't want her up here, so she of course. continued to, <laughs> of course. to make her, her presence known. <laughs> Thank you. Well, congratulate Kami. That's great. Dan? Uh, I have nothing. Thank you. Heather? So I'll just make a request on the back of... Um, your comment, Brian, about the four hour meeting. If the meeting is looking long, could I make a request that we start a little earlier? Um, you know, like if we if we really have a that full of agenda, can we consider starting at 630? Um, I know our our know our um, but there's some policy or something about the seven o'clock time that we set in the beginning of each year and it's a special meeting and all that stuff, but I just would request that again, if at all possible. We've done that so before. I, I think that's good to talk about right now. I, I, I see the October 13th meeting as a long meeting. Yeah. Myself as well. Can, can we? Can we even start at six? Uh, I was just gonna ask, can everybody make it at six? That we would order things such that that the real part of the meeting didn't start till seven, but we could get through a lot of the other agenda items. Okay, Kath Kathleen and I will. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate you considering that. Um, and just one other quick thing. Um, I had a fabulous time last Friday. So you know, big thanks to Jim and B Trans and ECI and Kabricki, and I'm sure I'm forgetting four or five, but it was really great to be a part and, you know, get to ride the train. And um, I was, it was great to see people downtown, um, you know, even despite everything. Brian, great job on the remarks. I've really enjoyed some of the videos that I've seen from the event. And um, so, anyway, I just wanted to, to, say how much I enjoyed that and I'm looking forward to you know hopefully being able to celebrate the final end of the project sometime next summer um and then excuse me on that same note just um just really impressed with the level of presentations that we're receiving from committees and staff um you know just really impressed with the energy committee's presentation really impressed um with Dana's uh presentation on the fines and um so i just wanted to to acknowledge work well done and um it just makes for really enjoyable reading when they're so well done i think so that's it okay thanks heather looks like farhad got knocked up again and i i totally get his frustration so uh We'll, we'll go, we're going to change a little bit, open it up for uh, the next meeting, especially it's going to be a pretty critical meeting. So to have 
good at connectivity is going to be important. Make sure that we can all participate. Heather, I, I totally, I would echo all of your comments. Thank you to the community for uh, coming out and making that a truly special day for everyone that was there. Uh, so exciting to, to, to have our roads open and know that they're not going to get closed again. So, um, Let's uh, I'm looking so forward to the big celebration next year. Say a prayer tonight that COVID uh, is behind us at that point and that it can truly be what we have envisioned it to be, a big celebration of our community. So, okay. Um, with that, uh, you know, a lot of good stuff. I, I, Impressed that, like you are, Heather, and everybody is, the, the professionalism of our staff. And that comes out in everything that goes on around here. So, and that starts with your leadership, Kathleen. Thank you. Hey, Brian, I was just uh, thinking we're only five minutes behind adjourn time. <laughs> I. I blew it. I, I, <laughs> I lost. I stopped looking uh, at my time. So <clears throat> slacking. I'll seek a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. <laughs> okay. All in favor of adjourning. Thumbs up. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night.